Okay, this is Phil Simmer with another uh, video podcast interview slash lesson slash quiz. Uh, I decided to do something different this time, and I just randomly threw a pin at the map, and it hit on Valparaiso, Indiana. So I checked with the Chamber of Commerce to find out who is the best backgammon player in Valparaiso, Indiana. There wasn't too much to choose from, but they came up with this guy named John O'Hagan that some of you may have heard. Uh, I've got John on the line with me right now. John, how you doing? Very good. Happy New Year. How is it? Yeah, Happy New Year. Today is the, uh, the second, the first, and uh, we're very excited to, uh, to be doing this together. Uh, this is a couple of pictures of John that I grabbed from my little scrapbook. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, John is, uh, has been on the Giants list and one of the top 32 and often much lower than that uh, for many years and won many, many tournaments. Uh, recently, they started the BMAB, uh, which is recording matches and, and recording people's PR and their level of play. And John currently is ranked number eight in the world uh, based on his actual uh, playing performance uh, at an average PR of 3.29. I just looked that up. And uh, a few years ago, when I decided to start teaching uh, professionally, one of the first things I was partners with Perry, one of the first things I did, that uh, Perry and I did, was we, we found out that we were getting too many students and we needed help putting together our lesson plans, and we immediately uh, brought on John O'Hagan and Stick, and uh, John has been with us ever since. He's been teaching consistently and uh, has helped us put together a lot of our material, particularly on the queue. John, I think I would classify you as one of the one of the, uh, the foremost experts, the experts in the world on the cube, not just because of your knowledge of the Dublin cube, but also because of the many shortcuts and, and many strategies that you've used to make the math easier, to make it work better over the board. So I hope I can embarrass you today and show you a few cubes of them, but then you might get wrong, because I'm going to test you a little bit on that. Um, you probably you, will. Yeah. Have you always been really good at math? I know there's a lot of math involved, and I know you're great at it. Have you, were you good at math as a kid? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what kind of education did you, did you have? Did you specialize in math in school, or what did you do? No, uh, actually, uh, in college, I, I went to uh, Indiana University and majored in business. So, no. Now, so you grew up in Indiana? I did. Yeah. And that's why you're you yeah. just, did you, did you uh, grow up in Valparaiso? No, I grew up in the South Bend, Indiana area, and, uh -huh. which is about an hour away from Valparaiso, where I now live. So, uh -huh. so you figured out Valparaiso was just a good place to hide? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were in sales for many years, and now you are, you've retired recently, is that right? Yeah, that is correct. So, are you completely retired or semi-retired or what? Uh, completely, yes. Completely. But you teach backgammon, and you play backgammon, and uh, you had warned me that uh, that after you retire, we're going to start seeing you in a lot more tournaments. But I don't think I've seen you at that many. Are you planning on doing a lot more this year? Two thousand. Yeah. Well, I think this past year I went to about seven or eight events, and I'm planning on you know approximately the same number again this year. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so you're going to go to San Antonio then uh, to uh, Gibraltar. I don't think I'm going to San Antonio, but I am going to Gibraltar, which is the week after. Yeah. Uh -huh, I got you. Uh, okay, so you know, one of the things that, that uh, you taught me that I teach all of my students is your uh, your formula or your strategy for determining when to cue. We, I, I, you, I know you agree with all of us that we use Wolsey's Law first to see if we think our opponent is going to take or pass. But if he's going to take, the major reason that anybody ever has to double with somebody is going to take is, except that you might get a, a bad pass, but assuming he's a good player, the major reason to double with somebody's taking is that they're going to lose your market too much. And it was always kind of a nebulous thing uh, is to try to determine how much is too much until so you came up with uh, O'Hagan's Law, which, correct me if I'm wrong, if you lose the market about 25% of the time net, Assuming the other rolls aren't too bad or good either way, you can generally double and test it with extreme gamma, and it works great for most positions. How did you come up with that idea? Where, where did that come from? Yeah, um, well, I just kind of was trying to figure out uh, 
some way to quantify um, when you should double. And uh, I don't know, it's just something I noticed that, uh, you know, if you have about nine, you know, market losers out of 36, and you're doing all right on the other 27, then you probably can offer an initial double, you know, with the cube in the uh -huh. center. Um, and uh, as you said, you have to take out the anti-joker sequences as well. So if you have, say, 12, you know, uh, marker losing sequences and you have four anti-jokers, then you only have a net of eight. So that's uh -huh. probably not enough to double. Yeah, and I have some examples that show when you hit eight, it almost always says it's not a double. Uh, you know, of course, we're talking about money and normal match scores. Uh, these will change you know, if you have uh, a real high gamma value or different scores. But I also found when it's right on the edge of nine, it's right on the edge of a double. Extreme gamma seems to agree with you most of the time. But you you wanted to quantify it. You seem to, you seem to do that with everything you can possibly, don't you? You have that tendency to try and quantify everything in that gamma. Yeah, well, so, you know, I mean, uh, where where possible, yes. I mean, because uh, you know, um, you know, like a, for example, a lot of players use the, uh, um, you know, uh, let's see, that uh, race position threats uh -huh. uh, as a uh, guide to whether or not to double, and that wasn't really. I, I find that too general. It doesn't really help me too much. I guess to each his own, but. For me, I want to have uh, a little more precise way of coming to the double or no double choice, uh, just based on something more exact than that. You know? so, so what you taught me is, is look at the position, and if you can, estimate wins and gammons, and come up with a gammon adjusted take point in the cube big and do it in a more quantifiable mathematical way. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I agree that your way is, if you can do it, if you can estimate wins and gamuts, and you have enough references and enough skill to do it your way, it certainly works great. The PRAT, or position, race, and threats, I have found that for lower level players that don't have much of a clue of what the gamut percentage is going to be, that's sort of a useful guy. But I think when you start getting okay. to your level of play, I see exactly what you're saying. So that okay. you really... You really need it. But when I try to teach gamut adjusted take points to a 10 or 12 PR player, they're lost. When I try yeah, and teach it right. to, when I try and teach it to a, a 7 or 8 PR player, they get it. And, okay. and they have the, they have enough references to get it. So I think that's part of it too. And also the kind of position it is. I mean, there's yeah, lots right. of positions there where you, you can't possibly use a PR 18 for a back game or for a, yeah. a racing game or for a priming game. You know, it's, you really have to quantify the position. Okay, let's see. Uh, anything else in particular that you wanted to cover uh, before we get into my testing on these positions? Anything going on in back, Evan? What do you think about the new uh, USBGF rules about the dice on the checkers? Any opinion about that? Well, I think there's going to be an initial period there where all of us, not all of us, but a lot of us are going to just automatically pick up the dice because we're so used to doing that. Uh, so that could cause a problem there. Um, but on the other hand, if you are, say, playing a match and you're real low on time and the right hand of the board that you are rolling into is the side where both sides are bearing off, and you're really low on time, and you, and you roll the dice, they get cocked, you roll them again, they get cocked. You know, that's the problem. So I can understand the logic behind it, yeah. Yeah, it's also more unfair if you happen to be the one that happens to be rolling on the side where the bear off is going on. Exactly. Which, that, which is one player, one player unfairly for the whole man. So I, I can see the rationale about that. What's your opinion about legal moves versus non-legal moves? Yeah, legal moves I totally agree with, uh, 100%. Uh -huh. And, uh, okay, good. Yeah. And so pretty much you like the new USBGF rules, it's just a matter of people getting yeah. used to them. Yeah. Yeah, that first, uh, you know, about the dice landing on the checkers, uh, I guess we're just gonna have to get used to it. You know, uh, I have no, I have no problem getting, I have no problem getting used to it at all. Oh. I, I got you, you know, it was, it was done as a trial when the Rory's tournaments in Chicago and Speed Gammon, where it makes a lot of sense to Speed Gammon, and we never, we never really had a problem. Good place oh, okay. to get used to it right away. I don't, okay. I, I didn't find it interesting. But a lot of people had problems with it. Okay, uh, so here's what happened yesterday. 
we had every Saturday we have a show in Chicago, and you come and played in it a couple times. And I know you know, uh, always, you always did well, and uh, you, you could be a great duet player. And I'm thankful that you don't live right in Chicago because uh, it would certainly cost me a lot of money if you were in our duets every day. But we always have a bunch of positions where we fight, we argue, and I won't tell you who the players are. Uh, but, uh, but you always know Carter's in the game, so that's that, that always uh, raises the heat level. And, and, we always have good debates, so I'm not going to say who did what, but I'm telling you, the under position I'm about to show you, we had, we either got it wrong or had debates about it or even made bets on them. And I want to okay. ask, you haven't seen these before, let's just see how you do, and we'll make it into a lesson, too, because after we see the right player, let's see if we can, if we can explain why to our audience the right player is right. So let's get right started. I, uh, they're not in a good number sequence because I've only narrowed it down to the ones that I think are more interesting for the purpose of this video. Okay, so here we have a, a, a checker play problem, red to bear in with a 4-3. The has been turned. These are all money games. And this is a very obvious question. Do you play safe or do you leave a blot in the outfield? Okay, all right. So. The safe play would be seven three five one. Um, that doesn't look right to me. I think you want to uh, bring uh, two guys in from the outfield to increase your gammon chances. And uh, admittedly, it leaves a seventeen to one shot. But even then, his two and four points are open. So uh, it's not that horrible if you're hit. And in the thirty four out of thirty six, where you don't get hit, you can start your bear off quicker and you win more gamuts. So uh -huh. as far as far as how you play it, do you play two men into the four or do you play eight, four, eight, five? Um, but well, for sure, eight to four. And then is it eight to five? Let's see, that would be the uh, hair. Um, yeah, eight to five would be, let's see, if you roll five, five, couldn't move the guy in the seven point. Uh, let's see here, eight, four, eight, five. Okay, I, I think you play eight to five with the. Okay, so what, what John is doing here, he's going through every possible role to see how many roles hurt him uh, if he makes one play or the other. But you've already decided you're going to leave a, uh, you're going to volunteer a shot in the outfield, and that means he's got a seventeen to one shot right away, which, whichever one you play. So let me show you the answer first of all, and you are absolutely right. Uh, you were actually right about which shot to leave as well. So the, the best play is to leave a shot on the seven point, and the second best play is to leave a shot on the eight point, and the wrong play is to not leave any shot and, and, and bring them both in. And when you bring them both in, let me show you what it looks like. You said that doesn't look like right. What do you mean by that? Oh, sorry. Uh, what I mean is um, you're stacking a third dead check around the ace point, and... Um, so that makes it harder for you to bear off quickly. Okay? Absolutely. And you're bearing a checker down there so that when you do bear in, uh, quite often you're going to be forced to play another checker down to your ace point. And if you ever leave a shot, it might well be when you don't have many checkers off. Okay? That's um, number one. Number two is if uh, blue rolls a two, it's not going to be super easy for you to clear that eight point safely. Uh, safely. Uh, you won't be able to if you roll a six or a one. So you might have to give up your, uh, you know, another point in your board prior to clearing your eight point, which would be really bad. No. Okay. So what, another way of saying this, and, and by the way, I did get this one right. Uh, the the idea here is that yes, you're you're very unhappy if he rolls a two five, but how unhappy? But there's a bigger sequence. If you don't leave a shot now and he rolls any two, and then you leave a shot, it's a direct shot that gets hit 11 or 12 times, which is a heck of a lot more than two out of than two times out of 36. So yeah. you're taking a small chance now to avoid a big problem later, and 
John's other th uh, comment is another major reason I did this also. When you're bearing your checkers in, you want your checkers up high. Uh, lots of people think, well, the faster I can clear the high points, the better. Well, the truth is, the faster you, the fewer checkers you have on the high points, that's the faster you leave a shot that you could get hit and still lose the game. So if you have more checkers up there and you don't clear them so fast, and you leave a shot if you've got five, six, seven checkers off, even if you get hit, you might still win. And then if you don't get hit, as John said, you win a lot more games. So volunteering the shot is, uh, was the right play here. And you made another comment that I found interesting uh, because he has these two open points. Would that change your point? Well, he didn't the have fact that open the, well, the fact that the two and the four are open means that being hit is nowhere near lethal for you. Uh -huh. Let's, let's no, make it lethal. Uh, let's make it lethal. Would that change your play? Well, uh, maybe. Um, I'd have to think about it. Uh -huh. the, uh, I, let's see, if he rolls it two, he's going to break. Well, let's put it so he doesn't break. Let's make it super lethal so that he can't even break. Uh, uh, it's closer uh, now, anyway. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think I'd still pay now, uh, 8485, is, is that right or not? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I haven't checked it. You and I both know, but I would leave the shot. I would do the same as you. I would not go down. I would not throw a checker down to the ace point. And, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's correct. It's still correct. It put my pretty good margin. Very good. You're back a thousand. But now, also, the, the, uh, oh, well, yeah, sure. let's, the one, one last comment on this one. The, I think the swing between the top two plays uh, with his two and four point open is uh, if you play two men to your four point, eight, four, seven, four, notice your next shot, if you roll six, four, you have to play the four in and then leave a shot with the six. Whereas if you play two men to the five point and you roll six, five, you know, that's safe play seven five off. So I think that's the reason for the point oh two eight, you know, difference. Right? I got you. Well no, this this yeah, this play is this play. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Oh, I mean the yeah, third best these, play. These two. Yeah. Well well no, this play. is with the closed board here. But with the yeah, this position is that we looked at or you know, uh, he had his two and his four point open and uh, I think the uh, two men to the four point came in second with uh, in in that position. Oh. Now, now John O'Hagan has been playing for many years. He's one of the best in the world. Now, look how long it took him to go through the roles to think about every role in order to come up with a decision. 90% of mediocre players will never take that much time, and they have far less knowledge than John has. You cannot play this game well and play fast unless you have a very simple uh, reference position. In order to go through all the possible roles to see which ones leave shots one way and which ones leave shots another way, it takes time. And uh, most of the students that I have, you know, they're playing online and they're under pressure to play fast or they play live and they're under pressure to play fast. And that's why when you go to a tournament, you take your time. Uh, but again, we had to stop people from taking forever uh -huh. by putting, cl putting clocks on tournaments. What do you think about clocks in tournaments? Do you like that idea? Yes, yes. That's fine. Yeah, I've yeah. never lost a match on time, and when it gets close, I just play faster. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but see, there's more than enough time for most matches, even with the clock. It's a generous amount of time that it stops people from really holding up tournaments and right. really being rude. But at the same time, the, the, the point here is we just listen to one of the best players in the world. Take take some time to go through the roles. Which one's going to leave more shots? Well, how, would he, how am I going to play a side from here? Maybe maybe that's the only role that really hurts you, but why have a role that hurts you if you can make another play where nothing hurts you? So it's worth going, and you have to simply go through the process to do it. Okay, let's move on. All right. Very good. Number four. Uh, this is right up your alley. This is a cube action problem that somebody got wrong. Uh, this is blue on roll cube action. Money game. Blue cube is in the center. Cube action. Okay. Uh, the race is close. Uh, blue is uh, using the Woolsey rule. Am I sure that red has a take? Uh, no, I'm not. Not at all. So I'm definitely doubling. Six, one, and five, two hit. Four two makes the anchor or makes the nine point. Two two is good. 
six six is great. Five five is great. Uh, so yeah, definitely double. And can Red find a take here? Now well, let's see here. Not many, not that many gamut lost for for Red. Uh, let's see here. Red will probably have some control of the outfield, which is the blue might um, when he runs off the 21 point. That could be a problem for, for blue if red can get lucky and point on him. And hit. Race is close. Uh, let's see. Six one five two. So the using the O'Hagan's rule is also a double since you have those four hits outside. Those mostly lose the market. Well, if I if I if I make the same conclusion that you came to, that I'm not sure he's thinking. I don't even mess with O'Hagan. Yeah, no, that, that's true. So, yeah. Yeah. so it makes yeah. the double decision automatic if you don't know yeah. what's taking. Uh, I'm having a hard time with the take pass. Let me think about this. I'll give you my best guesstimate here. Um, Hmm. I'll guess pass, but I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh -huh. Well, over the board, this was taken, and it's a big pass, so you guessed uh -huh. right. And uh, I wasn't sure. This is one of the reasons we, I took a picture. The reason I have any of these positions is because I took pictures. I, I, I discarded maybe 15 pictures of positions that were too close or didn't matter too much. But this is a big, big pass. And it was taken over the board, and I honestly wasn't that sure uh, if it was a yeah. take or a pass. I thought it was probably a pass, but I wasn't sure at all. And I was—I yeah. didn't know how to come come to the answer. But it's not even yeah. close to a take. Yeah, it's uh, one point one four, and then the gammons for blue are a little bit higher than what I had expected, twenty-one percent, and the um, red wins about five. So the give us chances are on twenty-six percent. So with a net of about. 16% gammons against red, 26% is not enough to take. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what John just did is he took the gammons uh, that that uh, blue loses, which is about, say, 21. Uh -huh. And he wins gammons 5%, which is a net of 16. But the gammon value in a money game, for those of you who aren't aware of it, is 0.5. So those 16 gammons is equivalent to eight games. Now, if the take point in a, in a money game is 25%, then you add 8 to 25, that's 33%. But So that would be the take point, except that it lowers a little bit because you have some value in holding the cube. So it lowers about 3 4%. So he would have to win the game somewhere around 30% if you use John's method of gamut adjusted take points to come up with a, uh, a take. And since he only wins 26%, he's falling quite a bit short of how much it takes to win. Now, again, how many people can estimate there are 21% gammons and 5%, you know, and, and, the, and the winning chances? That's the hard part, unless you really are, have put in a lot of positions and have a lot of references. So even John, you have a little difficulty with this, but he made the right decision. That's the, that's the key. Now, yeah, I, I don't think take, many humans would get 21% gammons out of this position. You know, uh, actually plays so well that you know, it makes plays that we just wouldn't make, you know, so uh -huh. might be a closer call against the average human. So. Oh, so you don't think it's, it's a matter of the uh, how good you are at estimating, it's a matter of how good you are playing to be able to get that many games. Yeah, I mean, in most cases when Blue wins this game, you know, it's pretty easy to see the sequence is that he'll end up priming one man, right, and closing out that one checker. Meanwhile, Red will move all his checkers into his inner board and hardly ever lose a gamut, right? Yeah, that's like 3%, something like that. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, but it actually finds a way to win a lot more than that. So. 
Well, XG probably makes a prime and waits for it somehow goes back for another checker, which one of the one of the reasons you can do that is because red's got a major liability having his two point bait. That's the that's one of the worst features of Red's game. Do you agree with that? Yes. That's what, makes this, that's what makes this so bad. I mean if Red had a better it, let's just let's just put him up to the three point. I don't know that that would make it a take, but let's just see how much better his game got because he didn't have the lousy two point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it still has to be a pass, but closer. Yeah. And also for Red, if Red succeeds in escaping his back checker, I mean, he's only a little bit ahead in the race. So, so now it's it's just barely a pass now. Well, yeah, that's, that, made, that made a huge, huge difference. This, this right. That two point is a real liability, and I don't have to tell you what happens if you put the checkers here. Uh, right. you, you know, gonna, then it's going to be a very big take. And, and then uh, the doubles start to get a little bit tougher right. when, you, when you put right. it there. Right, right. I agree. So yeah, I find I, I think it's very interesting, and that's where using that uh, position race threats isn't a bad thing because it start, you start to notice features like that quicker than if you're yeah. doing just test your number estimates. I, I mean, it, I, my eyeball went to here immediately. We know how bad it is if Red has the one or the two point. Uh, because later on, if he gets a shot, he's not going to be able to contain blue very well. If he's got the three point or higher, it's not anywhere near as bad. Okay, very good, John. You're still mad at a thousand. Let's go to the next one. Number uh, five. Another cube action problem. This is uh, red on roll, cube action. Should red double? And if red double, should blue take or pass? Huh. Interesting. Okay, so here, Blue has a 2-3 game, but only 27 pips down in the race. And something's going to give pretty quick for Blue. going to have to give up one of those anchor points, or he's going to have to start tearing down his board. Unless he can hit a shot. So, let's see here. Am I sure that Blue has a take? No. So I would double. No. Can blue take? These seven pips. Mm. These seven pips down. Um, I think I I pass as well. Double pass. Okay, but you got the, the you got the main thing right. It is clearly a double. And somebody argued that it wasn't a double and she went. Uh, and it is a very small take, so I don't I don't blame you. And that's not rolled out. That's just, that's a plus plus. Let me take a look and show you what it says at plus plus. Like about four percent, three point seven percent. So if that for those of you that don't aren't familiar with these numbers, the percentage of the stake that, that this is is very small. So John would have made a very small error here. Uh, and I don't blame you for passing, but again, this is a great illustration of Wolsey's law. He didn't have to worry about whether it's a double or not as soon as he realized that he wasn't sure it was a fake or not. That's all you need to know for sure it's a double. Because even if you're uh, even if you're not sure if the take or drop, he might not be sure either. It might make a mistake. Somebody might easily pass this cube, but if they take it, that's fine. You still have a very, very big double here. The other thing that John immediately did is he looked at the pip count. How many people, uh, unless they're really good players, even bother to count pips here? Most players don't count the pips. Unless there's a race, well, it's important also in back games because uh, this is a good timing in a back game for a two-three back game. Depending on where the checkers are, good timing needs to be closer to 90 or 100 pips down. Now, this one doesn't need to be 90 to 100 because he's got some awkwardness for a red. It's got a very uh, big liability that his ace point is made, and he's got two openings here, so. He doesn't really have to have 90 or 100 with this kind of a board, but he'd certainly like to be down 60 pips or so. 
And so this timing is one of the, the major problems. And the other problem that I thought was blue, I actually thought this was a pass uh, myself, and because Lou's got the ace point made and the five point over. This is, again, he's got the wrong points in his inner board, even though yeah. he's got a nice board. Uh, he yeah. gets a shot, hits it, yeah. the red rolls the five right away, and he's back in the game. Right, yeah. Okay. And uh, also, since uh, blue is really not that far behind in the pip count, in most cases, what's going to happen is that blue is going to run off one of those two anchors, and he'll just end up playing, uh, you know, either a 22 or 23 point holding game, you know. Uh, and uh, doesn't he run off the front anchor most of the time? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess it depends on exactly the sequence of rules that happen. But, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, right, yeah, I mean, that's most likely sequence, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to number six. Okay. This, again, is a cube action. Most of the big arguments that we have are on cube actions. But, so uh, this is right on roll cube action. Okay. Cube, in the cube in the middle, and the, the pip counts are even, and you've got, uh, let's see here, three, 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 two, three, one, and five really strong hit and cover numbers. Then you've got six, six, it's great for the race. Five five. If he fails to roll a two, it's a big market loser. Uh, let's see here. He's got some wastage on his one and two points. Oh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, it looks like a pretty volatile position. Uh, does Blue have a take? Yeah, I think he does. Uh, but it looks like it's volatile enough, so double take is my guess. Okay, so you're absolutely right, and Again, there were people that thought this was not a double, and uh, this is a clear double and a clear take. And what do you mean by volatile, and why does that make it a double? Okay. If you roll any of the following numbers, 3, 3, 3, 2, uh, 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, and in all those you put, you know, Blue on the roof against either a five or five and a half point. No, I guess always a five point board. And if blue fails to enter, he has nothing like a take, right? I mean, it's just a huge pass. So that's what I mean. It's the, your uh, equity, the equity swing on a number of those good rolls is enormous. Well, let's see. Right now, you, your equity is uh, what we, where is the equity? Uh, if you didn't double, if you, if you, didn't double your equity as point plus point five six. And if right. one of the things you say, let's say you roll some great roll like a three two, no. and blue doesn't enter, instead of point five six, your equity is now. Well, I mean, uh, you know, because of J uh, Jacoby in a money game, and there's no gamma. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so it's just going to be one point oh. But if, but so if, if you put the cube on take the Jacobi. other guy's I'll side, take off yeah. or if you take yeah. off Jacoby, there you go. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. So your equity is double. Your equity yeah. double. So what yeah. you mean by volatile is there's such a huge swing, and you lose your market by so much that uh, that you it, 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 is it Roberti that always used to say that when you got highly volatile positions, you have to double faster. I think it was Roberti's books. Could uh, could be. Like, could, yeah, and, and uh, so if you if you don't hit, you're not happy, uh, but you're not dead. You're not getting recued because blue isn't winning this race. So you're still in the game, uh, even if you uh, e even if you didn't queue. I mean, if you don't hit, unless you roll something that where you leave a shot, you can get in trouble. Like yeah, you got some bad sixes there where you have to yeah, you a good shot. Yeah, six one, six one, six two. Uh, and then six three, you hit and you know continue on the four point. I hope that he uh, doesn't roll a two. Uh, oh, yeah. Six five, leaves the shot. So yeah, I mean there's some bad I, numbers here. John, how do you play a six four? Six four. Okay, thirteen to seven is forced, and then you've got a four. Um, if you hit. 
Yeah, yeah, I think you just hit on the three point. Yeah, very good. Even though you're leaving the two blocks, you get hit back 20 times, but that's better than not hitting. Uh, well, I mean, uh, if you you don't have a way to not leave a double shot, do you? No, you don't. Yeah, if you play 13 to 9, that's a double shot. If you play 6 to 2 or 5 to 1, that's a double shot. So, so it's a double shot no matter what. So, so you this, put way you, this way you do leave three blots rather than two the other ways, but still, you know, you have to play to win as opposed yeah. to putting them yeah. to lose. Yeah. Uh, okay, got it. Very, very good. Okay, let's go to number seven. Okay, this is a another cube action problem. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, recube situation. Red is on roll over the two cube, and should he redouble, uh, and uh, if he redoubles, should we take her pass? Okay, good question. All right, so Wolsey real time. Am I sure blue has a take? Um, pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure he does. So, because only blue can win a gamut. And even when you roll a one or a three, if blue anchors, you might get lucky and win. And 16 times out of 36, you don't roll a one or a three. And then you're not happy that you recubed. Um, 20 market losers. Now the number, the other 16, are those anti-jokers? Not really. Game's kind of uh, up in the air with with the other numbers for the most part. Uh, let's see, five, five, you can hit loose as well. So that, that's pretty good. Um, let's see here. Should you redouble? Also, if you hit a three, uh, you probably will never, you know, hit the other blot. Well, if you hit all, if you hit both those two blots, and he doesn't anchor, then you've lost your market. If you hit one of those two and close out both checkers, you've lost your market. Um, sure. by, let me just say for for the you know this is going to be on YouTube, so there may be some people who are not that familiar with the term. Losing your market means that on the following roll, if you if you were to double, your opponent would pass. And the bad thing about losing your market is that if you double now, you might win four points. But if you wait until you hit the shots and then he he rolls badly and then you double, you're only going to get two points. So you don't want to lose your market if you can help it. At the same time, you don't want to double just because you might lose your market if things go too bad if you didn't hit here. So that's the back to the dilemma. No. All right, I am not at all sure on this one, but I think no redouble take is correct. You're absolutely right, except for one thing, that uh, the person who redoubled this got a pass. Well, so that's true. They, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. It, it, but it's a huge mistake to redouble, and yeah. you only write, according to Extreme Gavin, if you can get it past 30% of the time, yeah. then, then, then you can justify it. Uh, right, so yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, you have one answer in theory, but practically against a fallible human who is probably steamed because they probably just had to play a two, three to one, right? Yep. And, he came uh, in with a one. He came in with a one-two. So one-two, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He came in with a one-two. So, yeah, and you know, so he's probably thinking, oh man, you know, it's one of those days. It's just not my <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And especially if you're if you're red, you just flip that cube right out there, and then you grab the pencil and start to score. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the way I do it. If I if I think the guy might have a thing. Okay, so the reason this isn't a double is because when you don't hit those sixteen times, not only may you lose the game, but you get gammoned a lot, and the other guy doesn't. Uh, you know, yeah. things go bad. But you can still yeah, get you all obviously it. never gammon him. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, big, yeah. Uh, so big negative. And and yeah, also, so let's say you roll like a six three or a five three, and then he rolls an eight. You know that yeah. game is not super easy for you to win. I mean, you can still you know pull out quite a few of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what happened was 
now, because it was a shoehead, the only double one guy, the guy dropped. He, he didn't hit. He came in. Uh, the guy flunked, uh, blue rolled, something like double four. And now uh, uh, red rolls uh, a 6 1. How would you play a 6 1? 6 1. Okay, there you have to make a big play. 2 to 1 with the 1 hitting. And with the 6. Um, either play 12 to 6, 11 5, or you play uh, 19 to 13. Um, they're all they're all close. You got the big oh, okay. part. You, you got the part that people don't that don't see. You need to be soft. And I hope yeah. the, I hope the, the people of the uh, who are watching to see what John is talking about. You would actually hit what they call a banana split. Uh, yeah where you actually hit from two to one, leaving two blocks. Why would you do that? Because you would love to get hit right now and have a chance to pick up one of these other checkers. Lewis, Red is probably not going to win this game or can win this game very easily once he picks up another checker. And if he doesn't hit now and blue rolls a two, uh, or even a one, his chance of getting one. another checker are terrible. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the this is the kind of play that people like John C. right away, and again, this was missed in the shoe I was watching and out of the game, and I was in shock that the guy didn't even consider playing two to one. But our shoe our players are better than this. I'm, I'm making us look really bad. We make a lot of very, very good players. We're all looking players just about, and pretty good players. But these are these were some of, some of the mistakes. First, you know, this is the, we were playing, this is New Year's, and we were at a bar. So you, and we were and we were doing a couple of shots and welcoming in the new year and having some fun. So you know, we played a little bit worse than normal. Okay, let's go a couple more real quick. Um, this is another cube action problem. I purposely am doing the cube. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a check to play problem that everybody got wrong, and one play is far better than all the rest. Okay. All right. I don't know how you find um, all right. I like. The approach that was uh, created by Stick, where you ask yourself, "What's the DMP play?" And then, which play? That's, was that's the DMP, DMP means that double match point. Double match point. Is uh, yeah. So just you ask yourself, "What play gives me my best chance of winning the game?" Period. Okay. And then once you figure out, or once you do your best to figure out what that play would be. Um, that's generally the correct play, except if some other play either wins a lot more gamuts or if some other play loses a lot fewer gamuts. Okay. Uh -huh. So uh, here the DMP play is, I think, pretty clear to uh, make your seven point, eight to seven twice, make the anchor 24, 23, and then six, five. And so that's, I'm pretty sure, the DMP play. Uh, does some other play either win a lot more gamins or lose a lot fewer gamins? No. So this has got to be the right play. So okay. One one theory, I'm not going to say whether you're right or wrong yet, but one theory is you, it's often right, when you, especially when you have the six-point stack, to simply make the four-point. And that, that is wrong, but that's what one of the guys thought was right. Yeah. Uh, well, why that is wrong is, here? Yeah. Well, um, the, with an early double ones after you've made your five point, uh, it's often correct just to make your four point rather than your bar point. However, this is not really early. This is sort of a middle to late middle game kind of a position. And um, if you make the seven point, uh, that has some really good priming value for you. And it's going to be really hard for, uh, might well be really hard for uh, Red to escape out of there. Uh, and, yeah, and so, uh, and also making the anchor uh, takes away his chance of a fluky blitz, you know, kind of a win. Uh -huh. um, and then six to five gives you a nice builder. So uh, that's, I'd be surprised. Okay, well, you nailed it. You nailed it. And any other play is a major blunder. And arguments were made for making the four points. Arguments were also made for making the 22 points. And, and go and play six to five. Yeah. Uh, so, so 
uh, if those are both tempting, you can see some value. But uh, I did feel this is the mission of Stick, and Stick did say something else, which is, uh, uh, I think, also a good thing. And that is, this does the right play does two good things. It makes an well, it makes a good point. Yeah, that is uh, another good comment to make. Yeah, uh, generally plays that two that do two good things are better than one play that does one great thing. And whereas, uh, you know, you might want to say that making the four point, if you think the four point's better than the seven point, you might say that play does one great thing. But uh, then you have two guys exposed over on the uh, on blue side of the board, and blue can run out with a six. Uh, when the race is closed, so uh, not really all that so, great. So two two good things is better than one thing, unless the one thing is spectacular. So unless, unless, <laughs> unless it's really crucial for some reason, yeah, which is yeah. Uh, doesn't yeah. appear to be here. And also, with now by playing six five, quite often uh, blue will either run or split on his next roll because he's really running out of constructive things to do otherwise. But now you've got uh, the two guys on the eight point along with your builders on six and five you can attack with. So that looks clear. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I got you. So uh, another another way to learn how to play these kinds of positions and what's right and why it's right when something else might be right is to do variations. And I'm not going to take the time to do it now, but <clears throat> you can move checkers around to where it would be right to make the four point, like oh, yeah. said early in the game. And you can move checkers around to where you probably should make the 22 point if he's got yeah. more ammunition here. Maybe even right. if he had the, this point made, you might right. be absolutely critical to make the 22 point. And then if the cube is turned, then you have to worry about gammons more. So then you can't afford to do two things. You have to save gammons, maybe. So that's another way, if you had a problem with this plane, the best one of the best ways to learn it is to keep moving checkers around and changing it to see what would you have to do to change the play. Okay, I got one more I want to show you that didn't come from the Chouette. Steve Sachs sent this to me, and I found it very interesting, and I want to see if uh, you would find the right play here. Um, this is, again, uh, this is not a money game, but I don't think it matters at this score. Uh, I think, it, I, in fact, I know the play is the same for money. So Red has a 5 one to play here. Okay. Um, oh, this is a match. Uh, three to two up to nine, you're trailing. Okay, you're seven away, he's six away. He owns the cube. You're 11 pips down in the race. You got a 5 1 to play. Okay, the natural or first glance play is just to make the one point. Um, you're going to be down but, uh, uh, five tips after the play. Uh, and you might get an indirect shot if he doesn't roll something totaling eight pips or more. What else could you do? You could play 14-8 uh, or 14-9-2-1. Um, I mean... Uh, let's see, if you're down five pips, score is probably not going to make that much of a difference. It would seem to me that... But there's a little quiz factor here, right? <laughs> right, if you wasn't for the quiz factor, would you would you just instantly make the one point? I believe I would. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. see, I think you could still take. Yeah. If you make, you know, I mean, the score isn't that... So one thing that one thing that you taught me, John. One thing you taught me is blue. If you just play quietly and let blue race here, he's not only up five pips. He's up five pips plus the roll, and the fact that he's holding the cube gives him about another eighteen percent advantage uh, racing wise because there's real cube efficiency in a race. So you really are in trouble in this race. Uh, more than it looks like, but more than the pip count says. He has yeah, he's he also has six. He has six outfield crossovers, and he's got four. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that, so, so there's a real racing problem, and that's why Steve's crazy play is one that I don't think any human would find. And and uh, uh, and, and there it is. <laughs> and and he, this is it rolled out. So his play is this: uh, intentionally leaving shots all over the place. 
uh, and saying, okay, I'm not going to win this game by racing. I'm going to, yeah, who would have made this play? Yeah, well, I was right. <laughs> we can, I, you can, I guess you can, you can make a, uh, you can come up with the logic for this play after you see it, but uh, I, I'm so glad you I, didn't get it because I feel, I feel more mortal now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did see the second play, you know, 14 uh, 2 one. I went out of Trent doing this. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, yeah. So wild. Uh, yeah. It is. It is wild. Let's let's make that play. Uh, let's make the play and see what the team action is. Uh, I guess the I guess it can't be a double. You wouldn't make the play, right? Uh, or it has to be a well, mistake. Well, necessarily. Necessarily. I mean. Uh, so let's let's see. Let's put blue on roll team action. Uh, if you're blue. I'm very tempted. <laughs> I'm very, I guess because he's leading the match, but he, for money, I would sure be very, very tempted to give this cue. I don't know. This is, this is very scary. What do you think? Uh, wow. Yeah. This I is, haven't checked this. I, I don't know. This it, just occurred to me to do this. Okay. So, any hit in cover, well, first of all, 6 4 is uh, the big market loser unless he comes back and hits you. Um, and any hit number that hits and covers one of your blocks, if he fails to hit, fails to enter, you've lost your market by a mile. Um, you win quite a few gammons in those sequences. Uh, you lose some gammons. Uh, it looks like a really volatile position in a money game. It's got to be a cube. I'd have to think about the score if that matters much. But. Uh, well, the fact that Blue's leading the score would make him a little bit shy on the cube. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, yeah. it would, yeah. So I'd have to think about that. But uh, for money, I think it's a redouble. It's pretty volatile to me. How about you? I don't know. I, I don't know. Because because if you hit, you're only probably going to cover one blot. Maybe you don't hit. Maybe you don't cover. I, don't, I really don't know. I, I'm not sure I double this. By the way, I invented or came up with the term reverse Wolsey's Law. And that is, I stole the idea from Wolsey, and I got kids' right. permission to call it that. If I'm not sure the guy has a double, then for sure I have a take. Right. So that's how I know. That's how I know if I were red here, I'm taking because I'm not sure Blue has a double. So if Blue gets me this cube, that's that's made it easy for me to take it because I'm not sure Blue has a double, and neither is John. So that that makes the take easy. And if, now, is it a double? I don't know. I I don't think I double, but let's see. I honestly haven't looked at this. Let's take a look. And then let's look at it for money and at the score. Yeah, here at the score, no, there's no redouble. But for money, it might be a redouble because they don't have that score factor. Let's see what it is for money. Very close, right on the oh, end. Right no on the edge. Yeah. Right well, on the end. Yeah. You can't fall. And that's not rolled out. This is plus plus. So, John, yeah. you uh, you were impressive. Uh, you on the on the uh, plays that we had. I think you missed one very small error uh, on a cube that was, if, if, by the way, that was rolled out. You might have even been right, and you continue to prove that you are a, a giant, and you're a great friend also, and I love working with you and all the help that you've given me and uh, my teaching over the years, and I really appreciate you doing this, and we'll be seeing you at more tournaments this year. Good luck. Yes. Yes. All right, Phil. And all right. Thanks happy again. New Year. All right. Happy New Year to you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks.